Tea tests, tea tests, they're so much fun. Compare the means and then you're done. Sort of. This video is going to explain what tea tests are, the different kinds of tea tests, hint, there's three, and what the data assumptions are. We'll end by doing some tea tests together and going through how to read the output step by step. So what is a tea test? A tea test compares the means of two groups and lets us know if they are significantly different from each other. There are two key takeaways from that definition. The first is that a t-test only works for comparing two groups. You can imagine the T in t-test standing for the word two if you like. The second key takeaway is that this test is used for comparing the means or the averages. There are three kinds of t-tests. The one you will most likely be using is the independent t-test. But yes, you do need to know all of them and how they are different from one another. So let's start. Up first, we have the one-sample t-test. As the name suggests, this is the t-test you would use if you collect only one sample. This sample is then compared to a value that already exists, whether it's provided information or a population value. An example would be if I know that the average person in the Netherlands bikes 3.5 kilometers per day. This is information that is freely available for me to find out. I don't have to calculate this or conduct any research myself to know this. All it took was a quick look on Statista. However, maybe I want to know how much the average HMSM student bikes daily, and we want to know if it's different or not from this population value. In this case, I will need to do a one sample t-test. Our variable that we are comparing is the distance biked. The second t-test is the independent t-test. This is the t-test you would use if you are comparing two separate groups to each other. For example, male versus female, or smoker versus non-smoker, meditator versus non-meditator, luxury hotel guests versus standard hotel guests, people who like cilantro and people who think cilantro tastes like soap. You can compare any two groups that you like. Let's go with hotel guests for an example. Maybe we want to know if luxury hotel guests spend more money on food than standard hotel guests. We have two groups and a measured variable the money spent on food. In this case, we will be using an independent t-test. Our third and final t-test is the paired sample t-test. Again, there's a little bit of a clue in the name. The paired sample t-test is used when you have one group that you want to look at before and after an intervention. An example, people are wanting to know the effect of an energy drink on heart rate. I choose a sample group of 30 people. They all show up. I measure their heart rate before they consume this energy drink. I wait 10 minutes. I measure their heart rate again. So now I have two separate groups that are related because it's the same people I've sampled. And we can call our first group people before the energy drink and our second group people after the energy drink. Note, it is important that you have the exact same people in your second sampling when performing this t-test. If you don't have the same people, it is no longer a paired sample t-test. So now that we are familiar with the three types of t-tests, we can look at what data assumptions need to be met in order to perform these tests validly. Rule 1. You must have one variable that is interval or ratio. A t-test compares means, so we need to have a variable that we can take the mean of. The other variable should be nominal or ordinal, as we need to have two groups or categories to compare. Rule 2. The data must be normally distributed. That means if we make a confidence interval for it, it should look like this. Rule 3. The variances should be equal. This is called homogeneity of variance. If they are not equal, we need to do a slightly different version of the t-test. At this point in time, you should be able to tell what type of variables your data consists of. However, terms like normally distributed and equal variance might cause a bit of confusion. What do these terms even mean? To say it simply, it means that the data of our two groups can be compared. There are two buttons you can click on in Jamovi to tell you if your data is normal and if it has equal variance. So we check the homogeneity assumption and the normality assumption. When we are checking assumptions, it is the rare time that we actually want our p-value to be higher than 0.05.
If these tests result in a p-value of less than 0.05, it means these assumptions have been violated. If these tests show significance, it should act as an alarm bell, telling us to do something different with our data. When they are not significant, it means we can move forward doing what we're doing. All is fine in the assumptions department. So talking about it is good and fine, but let's walk through an example. Students who do hands-on practice in Jamovi versus students who do not, and their outcome on the HRA test. Is this a hint to try some things out in the free software? Hmm, possibly. First things first, we need to set our hypotheses. This will tell us if we are doing a one-sided or a two-sided test. It is important to define this before we begin because it will affect how we read our test output. Okay, so my alternate hypothesis is that the average test score of people who do hands-on practice will be higher than those who do not practice. That means that my null hypothesis will be that the average test score of people who do hands-on practice is less than or equal to people who do not practice. This hypothesis has an assumption. I am assuming that hands-on practice has a positive impact. Therefore, I need to do a one-sided test. If my hypothesis were simply looking for a difference between the two groups, we would see it written as such. No direction is assumed and therefore I would need to do a two-sided test. A two-sided test tells us if there is a difference. A one-sided test tells us if we should expect a specific outcome. So, step one, set your hypothesis and make sure you know whether you're doing a one-sided or a two-sided test. I am choosing to do a one-sided test. Step two, check your assumptions. Let's tick those boxes in Jamovi and check the resulting p-values. In this case, we can see that both of our p-values are above 0.05, meaning that these tests are not significant. That is good. That is what we want. We can move forward with no issues. Step three, turn on the t-test and specify whether the test is one-sided or two-sided. This again loops back to our hypotheses. We check our p-value and we see that it's significant. Step four, Report your findings. We can do this more accurately by using the descriptives function in Jamovi. We can find out the effect size. Here we see a Cohen's D of 0 0.543, so a moderate effect. Or we can visualize our data in a plot or in a table. So our final conclusion is hands-on practice in Jamovi significantly improves a student's final HRA grade with a moderate effect size. Based on this, we can conclude that trying statistical exercises contributes to achieving a passing grade. This is the process of an independent t-test when there are no violations in the homogeneity of variance or in the normality. If these tests flag up significant, we do have to do a slightly different analysis. Fortunately, however, that just means choosing a different button from the test section in Jamovi. The one we want to choose is called the Mann-Whitney U-Test. Let's go through another final example. I read the other day that the color blue attracts twice as many mosquitoes as any other color. I'm going to compare blue to red and see how many mosquitoes come to each color. So let's do a two-sided test. I just want to see if there's a difference between the colors red and blue and how many mosquitoes come to each. So step one, let's define our hypotheses. We can see that I'm using the equals and not equals sign meaning that there is no assumption in our hypothesis and we are doing a two-sided test. Step two, check our assumptions. Hmm, something is not ideal. Our homogeneity of variance is fine, but the normality is not. But that's fine, it's cool, there's no need to panic. Let's just turn on the Mann-Whitney U-test instead of the standard T-test. So step three, turn on the Mann-Whitney U-test. Specify if your hypothesis is one-sided or two-sided. Here we are doing a two-sided test. And we can see that our results are significant. P is less than 0.05. Step four, report your results. We can see there is a significant difference between the colors red and blue and how many mosquitoes they attract. But let's find out which color did better and what the effect was. We can see that we have a very strong effect size, and based on the plot and the table, 
we can see more mosquitoes come to the color blue rather than red. We see this both in the plot and by checking the means in the table. So our final conclusion is, mosquitoes are significantly more attracted to the color blue than to the color red. The magnitude of this effect is very large. Based on this, we highly recommend that you don't wear blue if you plan to hike in mosquito-infested areas to minimize the chance that you get bites. So now that we have gone over what the three types of t-tests are, what the data assumptions are for a t-test, and we've walked through two t-tests together, let's go over some key takeaways from this video. Number one, a t-test is a comparison of means of two groups. Number two, there are three types of t-tests, the one sample t-test, the independent t-test, and the paired sample t-test. Number three, the assumptions for a t-test must be met in order for the t-test to be valid. These assumptions are that you have to have at least one interval or ratio variable that you can take the average of, and two categorical variables, so ordinal or nominal. The data must be normal, and the data must have homogeneity of variance. Number four, set your hypotheses before you start your analysis. Choose whether you are doing a one-sided test or a two-sided test. Number five, check your assumptions. Number six, based on your assumptions, choose the appropriate t-test whether you're doing a standard t-test or a man whitney u Number seven, report your results. And finally, a secret eighth takeaway, have fun. And now that you have the t-test knowledge in your pocket, enjoy all the endless comparisons and analysis that you can do. As always, if something is not clear, please note down your questions and bring them to class where either myself or my colleagues will endeavor to explain further. Bye for now.